show of hands. I can't see how many people right. are here. How sure. many people? How many people have ever been to the St. Augustine alligator farm? I think I've been once. <laughs> I only see myself and three other screens. Oh, everybody's <laughs> okay. So lots of people have. It sounds like, or maybe not a very high percentage. Can you see uh, everyone? Well, I am going to give just kind of a brief overview of the setup for our waiting bird rookery, um, at least for the major part of it, for those that haven't been there and kind of just, maybe this is a little bigger picture than what anyone's experienced when they've been there taking pictures or just birding or just having to, happening to be there as a tourist. So this is uh, the native swamp and rookery at the St. Augustine Alligator Farm Zoological Park. So a little brief history about the alligator farm. It has been around since 1893. Now that's not at the current location. The, the zoological park has been in a current location since the 1930s. Prior to that, it was across the street where the ocean now is. Um, after a series of fires, they the owners way back when, bought some property inland, <laughs> still on the island. It's actually one of the highest points on the island. Uh, so it's really worked out well with storms. Uh, we have been a member of the AZA, which is the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. It's a network of a, about 250 plus or minus couple zoos and aquariums across the country. The gold standards, the highest um, accreditation and wellness uh, requirements and so we've been a member of that for quite a long time. The St. Augustine Alligator Farm has actually never been a functioning alligator farm. It's just an old name like, and that we have not changed, but we have never harvested alligators ever for, for their skin or their meat. Um, it's just at some point in time when there was a collection of animals, you call it a farm. Uh, right now we have 25 species of crocodilians Historically, we've been able to say we have every species of crocodilians out there, um, but DNA and splitting of genetics just per genetic research keeps growing these numbers. So I think right now, pretty soon there's going to be 27 species of crocodilians, and so we have 25. And this is actually the first presentation that I've said 25. Every presentation prior to this, I've said 24 but there's now a new species that we happen to have, yay. <laughs> and that would be um, a new species of dwarf crocodile from Africa. Of course, we're talking about birds here, but actually crocodilians are really similar to birds. They lay eggs, they protect their young, uh, they have same chambered hearts, they don't fly though. So I'm gonna be focusing on our swamp. Our swamp is two acres. And there's a nice winding boardwalk, not as beautiful as Orlando Wetlands giant new boardwalk right now, but it is a beautiful boardwalk. It's just a little bit shorter, I should say. It is just as beautiful. Um, so it just winds through the two acres. And this is where the rookery really is primarily situated. Um, the swamp was, was basically fenced in in the 1970s and wading birds that nested in other parts of the zoo then moved out here and this is their primary location. They do nest in throughout most of the zoo at this point, but we do like them in the swamp the most and I'll kind of get to why we prefer them there. One, it's very easy to count them or easier. So this is the different angle. This is facing to the south. So you can see it keeps on winding through the bushes and the trees. I came across this really old picture. I'm, this looks like it may be one of the original boardwalks and um, it's a little scary and not so safe looking. <laughs> We've made some modifications over the years to help ensure the safety of guests and of our animals. <clears throat> and one of the things we did last year um, is add this cabling to the very top, three rows of cabling in a couple areas we only added two or we ended up removing a row. Um, this, was, this is another step we've done to ensure the safety of our guests. It's not so popular with photographers, which is why we removed one of the rows, but it is something that we really felt like we needed to do to make changes to make sure um, people were staying safe and helping 
minimize them from doing stupid things. The St. Augustine Alligator Farm has been a member of the Great Florida Birding and Wildlife Trail. So there's a couple thousand miles of trails throughout Florida. And I believe it's even spread into Georgia, even though they still call it part of the Florida Birding Trail. And it's actually an excellent, any of these sites that are through the Great Florida Birding Trail, I'm sure you all are very familiar with this, but they're very, they're well known for their bird watching, wildlife viewing, and educational opportunities. And so we are one of those. So the St. Augustine Alligator Farm has eight primary nesting wading bird species. There, there's a couple that are really trying to get on this list um, and 12 just roosting species throughout the winter when it's not the nesting season. And we can have anywhere from 400 and up to 800 nests at peak count every year. So in a two acre location, that's a lot of nests. And when you have Every nest has two adults and two to four screaming kids. It gets pretty rambunctious out there. But even year round, there are thousands of birds that roost overnight in the rookery, uh, mostly white ibis. And it hasn't rained in a while. So um, that's, I guess you can imagine what that's like right now. So these are the species that are consistently nesting. We have the little blue heron, the great egret, tricolored heron, cattle egret. And actually cattle egrets are why, one of the main reasons our number spread is so vast from 400 to 800 nests per year. There's things that affect that every year, but when it's big giant jumps in numbers or sharp reduction in numbers, it's typically due to cattle egrets. Um, there's also snowy egrets, the federally uh, threatened wood stork, species of special concern here, the roseate spoonbill. And then we have the secreted green herons. We'll have a few nests a year in locations actually outside the primary part of the rookery. They don't like commotion. So roosting other times of the year, we have yellow crowned and black crowned night herons. I have noticed definitely over the last five years that yellow crowned night herons are the ones that are, um, they, they, there aren't as many of them. There seems to be less and less and there's a lot of black crowned night herons. Until this past year, I barely saw any black crowned night herons and I saw quite a few more yellow crowned night herons, but overall there were far fewer coming um, and roosting during the winter. So they do not ever nest at alligator farm. So I don't know if anyone's seen night heron declines anywhere else, but it was very noticeable this year. Um, so great blue herons also hang out. I've never seen more than three at a time. I'm not interested in them nesting at the alligator farm because they would just eat everything else, but they're always a beautiful bird to see. Um, and then we've had a small number of white ibis nests uh, the last few years. And we tend to be having at least one or two in Hinga nests now annually. And those are really neat. And they're just so different than everything else in there. And the chicks have their giant duck-like feet and they're just kind of looking very clumsy on the, on the tree branches, but they're, they're beautiful birds and neat to see. Something a little different for me, I guess. I look at a lot of wading birds. So why are all these birds coming to nests of the alligator farm? They're wild. Wild. We provide them the habitat, you build it, they will come kind of scenarios, what, what we say a lot. Um, but the, one of the main reasons they're coming is because of the alligators. It was done. Two months later, the same therapist was accused by another woman of inappropriate touching. Well, and no she one has their news on. <laughs> you wouldn't mind muting your, your microphone. Thank you. Um, so we have lots of alligators. So we have about 150 adult American alligators swimming in this two acre area and one male American crocodile named Hershey. And they are, they're the sentinels. They are taking care of the primary predators of nesting wading birds. So your tree climbing things, your raccoons, your feral cats, possums, snakes. 
those things are not making it across the water to get up into the trees. And so um, they are excellent guards. And so these wading birds look for this naturally, if, if it's whether it's um, just a random forest somewhere or a protected preserve in any of the states in the, in the southeast, they are looking for those alligator sentinels and nice clear waterways. Alligators help keep the mats of vegetation away from the, the islands or the peninsulas. And so that helps minimize the amount of predators being able to kind of walk across water basically. And they'll, they'll, they don't let much get by. Now, alligators do get many wading birds. They get the adults when they're going down to the water's edge or walking around on land, picking up sticks and chicks that are ejected or dropped from the nest for a variety of reasons. So they do get somewhat of a reward for their being bodyguards, but overall the, the nesting success is much, much higher around alligators than not. So yes, yeah, so here's some of the things that, that can go wrong. So seeing spoonbills in the alligator mouth is, is pretty disheartening. Um, of course, any species too, but somehow the pink is a lot more obvious. Um, but great egrets in particular, and many of these wading bird species practice infocide and siblicide. So if a chick is, is weaker than the rest, the parents will stop feeding it and will actually just try to kill it and stab it as they are in this bottom picture. And the siblings will do it to, to them as well. And eventually they'll just get shoved out of the nest and then they'll drop to the ground. And that's when the alligators get the reward. Survival of the fittest. Now, wading birds eat a lot of fish, primarily some crustaceans, um, but they eat a lot of stuff. And fish eating birds make very strong messes. So the guana is really acidic. It's, these are pretty good sized birds. So there's quite a bit of volume and it piles up over time. And here in St. Augustine, the drier season is this time of year. And it doesn't really start raining more regularly until closer to May, which is basically almost at peak or just when peak has passed in our rookery season. So by then we've already had hundreds of birds nesting and hatching and making a big mess. So there's a lot of maintenance that we have to do to try to keep things a little cleaner for guests, uh, keeping the environment a little healthier for the animals, our zoo animals, plus the wild animals that come, just trying to make everything a little bit better. Um, and with so many alligators in the rookery and so many birds above, there's a lot of rebuilding of banks all the time because the alligators slide in and out. Uh, we need to make sure that we're rebuilding those banks so that trees that the animal that the birds are nesting in have somewhere for their roots to stay. We remove a lot of exotic plants. It feels like it's never ending here in Florida, but we try hard and we plant a lot of native species. Now we also have hurricanes coming through on occasion. And so we do lose some trees. And so we do try to make sure that we're keeping up on replacement trees as needed, or at least preparing for the future. There's a lot of hosing boardwalks. Our maintenance department is amazing during the rookery season. They're not very excited about it because they spend hours per day hosing boardwalks. And it's not a very rewarding um, situation when you come in the next day and you're doing it again and you still can't get everything. Um, the last few years, we've done some tree trimming and palm tree trimming to keep birds from nesting directly over the public boardwalks and around our zoo snack bar, and that's made a big difference. There's still a lot to trees, and we continue to plant trees in other locations that are a little more convenient and easier on our maintenance and making it every easier for everyone to enjoy the birds. Um, there's also a rookery blog and a rookery hotline because people want to know all the time, what are the birds doing? When are the birds going to be there? When's this bird going to be here? So trying to provide that information readily out there to, to help make sure that people know when they want to come visit, they can plan accordingly. So with the maintenance that's done, it's done, of course, not during the nesting season, but in the winter time, usually after the holidays, because we're really busy at the zoo and then before the nesting season starts. So we have a short window of about five weeks. And so we're in that right now. And uh, this was actually taken last year, but 
by dropping the swamp in order to perform some of this maintenance to kind of keep the alligators in certain locations a little bit away from where we are, it makes it a really appealing fishing location for many birds, as you can see. Um, and I can't really zoom in, but what was great about this picture is there's a couple birds with leg bands. So you also get to kind of just walk around and practice some conservation and, and note who's where, when. It's pretty great. Uh, so what we're working on this winter is for those of you that have been to the St. Augustine Alligator Farm Rookery, there was this one historic main live oak we call on the island. We have been struggling to keep this tree alive for the last, definitely the last decade, but the last two decades. This picture was taken before wood storks started nesting at the alligator farm and the wood storks started nesting in 2000. So this is the kind of the best it's ever looked. And once wood storks started nesting on it, it the tree kind of started to, to decline. There was other reasons as well. Um, soil compaction of the roots by the alligators basking constantly at the base of it. And also the acidic pH. Oh, and then lastly, saltwater intrusion. So some tree species are more tolerant of saltwater um, intrusion than others. And live oaks are, tolerance on a lower level, but over time, because we're right next to the ocean, um, it just kind of, you mix that in with the poor soil quality and the compaction of the soil and the leaves being constantly covered in wood stork and great egret guano, guano, it makes it a little bit difficult for a tree to make it no matter what we did. We built a fence around the whole island so bird, so uh, alligators couldn't damage the roots anymore. We did air spade treatments. We mix in all sorts of organic material multiple times and put entire sprinkler systems just for this tree. And it probably helped it last a little bit longer than it should have. But this is what it looked like last week. So we decided it was no longer, it was a safety risk. There were parts of it that were falling down on the fence and destroying the fence that wasn't really doing what we needed it to do anymore anyways. And so um, I don't have a picture. I didn't take a really good picture um, today. I have a couple of pictures, but not of this. So we've kept three trunks because this is actually, there was probably about nine trunks and most of it was dead, but there were some few that still had, that were more solid than others, still had a decent amount of leaves on it. Not what you would see in a very healthy live oak. Um, but so we kept three out of everything and knock the rest down and use it to help build up the banks. And then we're in the process of, this was taken today, bringing in a whole bunch of new trees. So the plan overall will probably be about a dozen bald cypress and a half a dozen cabbage palms. So it's gonna look significantly different. It's gonna be amazing. Um, it's gonna look like a little tropical oasis island with all these bald cypress trees. And the beauty of bald cypress trees for nesting wading birds is they have that really fine leaves. So the guano doesn't stick to it very well. It's also tolerant of a much more acidic pH in the soil and their root systems, how they make all those little gnarly knobs help keep the banks from eroding. So we've planted more and more of these over the years in the swamp. And we've tried all different species of trees and they definitely by far do the best out there. So eventually we're gonna end up just having a cypress swamp, but those are pretty popular in Florida and the Southeastern United States for a reason. Um, the only thing that photographers and bird watchers and, and people that come to the alligator farm to see the rookery, they come this time of year and they, they think, what happened? It's so barren here. What did you do with everything? Forgetting that cypress are deciduous and um, not an evergreen tree species. So we need to wait for them to bloom out in early March or so. And until then, the birds are gonna start coming in and nesting, they actually already have. And the hot pink of the spoonbill shows up really well against the kind of barren trees, but it won't last for very long. It's gonna be, it's gonna be grand. Um, so here is signs that were made and I have them on little strings and we kind of move them around to those areas where that need to get hosed regularly by maintenance 
or maybe we're just going to leave that area alone and we put these signs on it. So when guests are walking around, they hopefully see the sign, even though there's really obvious signs of a giant ring of white. <laughs> um, and sometimes they'll be looking at a sign and there's droppings all over the sign and they they don't, it's pretty funny watching people look at the signs and they're not, they have zero awareness of what they're reading and what they're standing in. But um, we're doing the best we can to kind of keep people safe and clean um, and make sure that they're enjoying the birds as well. There are numerous revenue opportunities that also encourage our facility, of course. I mean, we need money for people to come in the door and take care of our animal collection and do our conservation research that we're very proud of what we do and supporting conservation partners, both locally and globally. To do that, you have to have money. Um, so we have a photo pass membership. And so for a few months a year during the peak season of the rookery. So our photo pass season this year starts the first Saturday of March and runs through, I believe it's July 2nd this year. And so photo pass holders can come in at 8 a.m. an hour early before the park opens for zoo guests at nine, and then they get to stay after the park closes to zoo guests until sunset. So they get to kind of the more prime photography time. We have birders just coming in too to kind of see what's going on and just have some peace and quiet while all the birds are nesting and raising their young. Um, and we have classes come, so from Flagler College, UNF, lots of high school classes, all sorts of classes, not just ecology, but animal behavior. And, and they come and it's just group classes for them, group rates, and they get to come in and they get special tours by the staff to help make sure that they are learning to really love nature and just the whole interconnection of ecology that exists within a rookery. And so it's great. Um, bird watchers, school groups. So school groups, this is just the younger elementary kids. We'll do migratory bird day projects with them. Uh, bird ID, we'll do all sorts of different things with the school groups, super fun. This is a really old sign. We haven't had these signs in a long time, but not a single wading bird has posed for me since doing something like this. So I still use this one. Um, so the birds are very close and habituated to people being around them. It's thought that their parents hatch there, their grandparents hatch there, and they are definitely desensitized to humans around them. Um, so here's a more modern sign, a little more detailed. These are special UV signs and they're also tolerant to droppings. There's a special coating on them. Um, they still only last about five years, but it's neat to be able to see a roseate spoonbill right there on the sign and then look up into the trees behind them. As you can see in the cy cypress, the roseate spoonbills really like to build a nest up there. Um, is there. Are there any questions I should address now before I, I move on? I'm not following the chat. <clears throat> I will presume not. Okay. I don't know who's monitoring the chat. So here's another example how they're habituated to the public. So these are tri tricolored herons. Um, I did not zoom in my camera, but it was just for my phone. I just took a normal picture and then they are, they're super close. There, there are a couple of questions. I'm sorry. I didn't unmute myself. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Terry wanted to know, are the gators captive or can they move in and out of the preserve? Those are our zoo alligators. Yes, they um, are have microchips and they are ours and they are not to be outside of our fence lines. All right. And they so have been fed by people, so they would be very dangerous outside. All right. And since you want to know what's the best times for photographers to photograph nestlings and fledglings, especially rosy at spoonbills? I guess I guess she means time of year. Um, so I'm going to I recommend going to our rookery blog and I'll kind of show that here in a minute. And I have a post on there. I think I'm going to bump it up to the top, but right now it's only about four down. There's a rookery blog post titled typical rookery schedule. And on there, it states what birds are displaying when, when, with, when, when are they nesting, when are they incubating, and when their youngs are hatching. So it 
it breaks it down like a couple of times a month and it's really detailed. And, and though they don't give me their schedule, they've been doing it for long enough. We've kind of figured out their schedule that it's a really good gu guideline. But peak, peak season is April, May, and it runs from February to July. And that's all the questions for right now. Okay, great. Um, so we have brochures that we hand out to the guests as well. So kind of their own little bird guide and it shows what's nesting and has some great pictures and a little bit of information. And on the back of the brochure is that typical rookery schedule that I mentioned. So you can see it right here. Um, I have updated it to so the version that's on the rookery blog is a little bit more up to date, especially for spoonbills. Um, spoonbills are very considerate where Yes, they're coming in in an abundance right now, but they really nicely space out their nest throughout almost the entire season. And there's birds nesting, spoonbills nesting and rat raising young almost the entire rookery season. It's very, very nice of them. <clears throat> so it's also a popular spot for nature photographers, as I've mentioned. So Sometimes of the year, especially uh, early in the morning, they'll just be lined up along the whole boardwalk. And there's lots of space and lots of birds. So it really works out as a win-win for everybody. Uh, we just updated our website within the last week. It hasn't even been a week. So it's going to look a little bit different than this, but there's still a wealth of information. I do need to go and make sure that everything's functioning properly from what I saw it was. So I've been working on this rookery blog for years. So there's so much historical information. Every year I do a kind of is in the season report. We have a photo contest every year. So I'll announce the judge and the winners. Um, there's species specific accounts. Work on uh, just kind of our construction projects that we've done for the year and some conservation projects. I'll kind of mention in there. So there's a whole lot of information. If you haven't checked it out and you want to visit, Definitely check that out before you come and it'll give you an idea of what you're going to be expecting. And I wrote a lot, so please read it. <laughs> um, so since 2011, we've been doing super detailed rookery counts, um, even though we've been monitoring the rookery since around 2001, um, a little more in depth, but this is going to be really, really, the really detailed information where we're out there nearly weekly doing counts of the birds. Um, so we're counting adults, nests, and chicks. And when there's 400 to 800 nests, it gets really crazy and counting does become a little bit difficult, um, but we do it. And so this is the total net peak nest count of all the birds. And you can see it kind of ebbs and flows. So really high years, mostly due to lots of cattle egrets nesting. And then it dips down to really low years. So wading bird nest or nesting is successful mostly because of the water table and their accessibility to prey. So if the water table is really, really low, like kind of like a drought, there won't be enough fish. The fish will be either dying, they're not gonna be reproducing. They are accessible for the birds to wade in and get, but there's not gonna be an abundance of fish. And same if the water table is too high and the water levels are really deep. There may be all that fish, but they're not concentrated. So the birds, it's really hard for them to do it. So for the years that are down low, it's most likely one of one of those things is too, too dry or too wet and they just can't get the prey. Um, you can have really banner years like, like this year, it's probably not cattle egrets. This was probably right after um, a drought. So you have a drought the year before and then you have an abundance of rainfall, but the, the earth is absorbing a lot of it because it's dry, but all these puddles are growing and filling up and the fish just breed like crazy. And there's just the water levels are the right level. There's an abundance of fish because they know all this breeding is all this rain's coming. And it's, it's it, that's when you have really, really popular wading bird years. This is really evident, especially down in South Florida with the Everglades and with all the water management wading birds are definitely indicative of water management and how well it's going or not in the environment by man. So we've had a couple down years. Um, 
After hurricanes Matthew and Irma, so Matthew was in 16, Irma was in 17, we did lose a few trees out in the rookery, but we replaced them. But the thing is when you lose a 30 foot tree, most it's hard to find a 30 foot tree replacement in time. So we always make sure that we're kind of planning for the future. Oh wait, we have a blank spot right here. We're doing some maintenance work. Can we just go ahead and plant a tree too before we wrap this up and move on to the next project? And so that's what we that's what we do. Um, so this is a little more confusing, but you can see, see, look, here's the here's the cattle egret line, the blue one. And they're just, they just come and go as they please all over the world. There we go. So not much lately. They're really pretty to see though when they have that brilliant uh, rainbow breeding plumage. It's short-lived, but it is really nice to see. Um, not noted on here, it says white ibis, but there's not white ibis. That bottom line is green heron. So you can see they have very few nests around the park, but they're also really secretive. Sometimes they don't find the nest until uh, the birds, the chicks are screaming. <coughs> Excuse me. So every year I have a rookery crew. They're phenomenal. Um, I usually have a couple of stable people that are there for year to year and kind of rotate. And then we get some college students coming in that are on like some sort of environmental science type degree. And they come in and get some hours for internship, internships or high school students for bright future scholarships. They are so amazing and they are so great. And they just stare up into the trees with binoculars and click on their clicker or make notes and uh, count our birds. So once a week, we do this species of uh, kind of bigger concern. So we're, we are counting wood storks weekly and roseate spoonbills weekly. And for right now, that's probably gonna remain the same this year, but FWC is also um, concerned about little blue herons. We don't have reddish, green, reddish egrets, but there's a couple other wading bird species that are in decline and they're wondering why. So we do a big monthly count of all species. Uh, it's once a month and we repeat that three times. So early on in the season, around peak season and then towards the end. And so far that data is suitable for uh, FWC and for US Fish and Wildlife needs. Here's an example of our check sheet. Um, we do it by different regions because it gets really confusing. Um, just there's a lot of trees and a lot of angles in a lot of areas. So we have different conservation partners we work with. So the US Fish and Wildlife Service, we work closely with for wood storks, wood stork recovery. Uh, FWC is just kind of the general, like all of the species, they, they're, they're concerned about all the species or want to know data on everything, but that once a month count is more than sufficient for them. Um, and then Audubon of Florida, we work closely with regarding roseate spoonbills. So the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Woodstork Recovery Plan. So the alligator farm is part of the recovery group that's made up of a, a bunch of different partners, shareholders between Florida, Georgia, and North Carolina and South Carolina. So where wood storks are, have spread and are breeding. And back in 2014, yeah, they were downlisted from endangered to threatened. And it was because of all the documentation of nesting and all the rookeries throughout this region that we closely have documented. Um, and then what they wanted to see was a consistent number of over 10,000 nesting pairs annually, kind of a steady growth. And that's what gave them that down listing. Very successful. It's funny to me because you hear about wood storks, they're, I mean, they're all over St. Augustine because they're breeding there. Uh, um, they do migrate. There are some kind of not uh, non-migratory individuals, but for the most part, they are migrants. There's a wood sort population that goes down, migrates Florida, and then goes across the Gulf. And then west of the Mississippi is another possible different subspecies of wood stork that migrates down through Mexico. Um, and there's very little intermingling across the uh, Mississippi River. It's very very drastic. This population is here and this population is here, but there's a lot that still hang out around uh, Florida that don't go all the ways down past South Florida. Um, they, they're 
common begging birds at, I say common, common begging birds here at boat ramps um, and down south there in south, southern Florida, they're caught. They really like landfills as well. Um, so that has helped them out because they've learned to adapt to humans and around human civilization. Um, it's problematic, of course, in many ways too, but it's helped them from continuing their downward decline. Um, I love their babies. I mean, they, they are too. They're, I guess, sometimes a face only a mother can love, but I think they're really dynam dynamic looking, very bold. I always can tell when the babies hatch, even though I usually won't be able to see them because they nest at the tops of the trees and I don't see them for at least a couple of weeks, but they always sound like a crying baby. And so I could always hear them long before I see the babies and I know that they hatch. Um, and then they're just giant and screaming all the time. Um, so we had a pretty successful year overall since they first started nest nesting in 2000. It's pretty much just been an upward trend, upward trend, a little dip here. Uh, we have seen a decline, but what's going on with wood storks is a long-term successful rookery for wood storks in one location is 10 years. They are so big and bad. They make these giant nests. They're big birds. They produce a lot of waste. They have giant chicks producing a lot of waste. Um, it kills rookery trees and rookeries really doesn't take long, takes a few nesting seasons and that's it. And so then they lift up the whole colony leaves and goes and finds a new site. So the fact that we've been able to keep wood storks at our site for now, this is the 23rd year and I've already seen wood, wood storks coming in a nest and still provide the habitat they need to continue nesting is pretty phenomenal, but it's, it's a lot of work for sure um, because of what they do. So that's why we're doing a lot of work right now, providing them more trees and they are they are fans of cypress trees so i'm hoping the fact that we're putting a dozen more in will help in that location um done some banding of wood storks with u.s fish and wildlife but it's quite difficult to get to our wood stork nests uh some other locations do boats and ladders and or uh lifts and we just have too many alligators so it that is a complicating factor. So if there's convenient locations, I can get a couple nests, I will, but it's, um, I think I've only banded wood storks two seasons ever. Spoonbills though, we do a lot more banding of spoonbills with Audubon of Florida and their numbers since they started nesting have also gone up significantly um, for the most part. They favor the tops of our cabbage palm trees. And so far all the cabbage palms look good. They do nest in other locations like bald cypress. Uh, and yeah, it's been mostly palm trees and bald cypress. They nest in there. A couple in oaks, but they look kind of weird when they're in the oaks. So they love the very tops, middles of the cabbage palm fronds. So this is not a bird that was banded at the alligator farm, but Years ago, when we started seeing juveniles come and roost through the winter, as those juveniles became mature, around three to four years of age, we noticed that they were sticking around past January. And huh, there's two standing together. And huh, they're a little bit brighter. And so the ones, there's banding that's been done. And this was over in the Tampa Bay uh, area. And so they had these aluminum red bands. And so we had numerous uh, birds with EB and EY and A3 or something like that. And they came over and we knew that they had been banded around 2005 and 2006, depending on the bird. And they were banding pretty heavily over in the Tampa Bay area at that time, those, those years. And so a lot of them came over into, uh, they just kind of, we think it was a big storm and a lot of them came over to the East Coast because they don't normally drift over that way but storms will do that to them. We also saw a few black aluminum bands and those are from the Florida Bay area, but that, those were pretty rare. So we've been banding. Um, we now have had three different colors. Originally we used this yellow with black lettering, but the yellow tended to fade really quickly. And so they're just kind of washed out looking now. 
but this is PVC bands are a lot better than the aluminum. The aluminum, the, the color would wear away pretty quick. And then it was hard to see the numbers. Um, then we switched to black and white bands, black bands with white text. And those were holding up pretty good, but I, would, I received bands last year. Oh, I picked them up and they're now, oh, excuse me, they're now red with white lettering. So we have Valentine's Day birds. That's what uh, Audubon had an abundance of. So they're like, here, you're now red and white. So if you see any bands of any of those colors, they've probably come from the alligator farm, but definitely report them. <clears throat> So here's just some old bands. So for the waiting birds, we do it right here above the, the knee, but it's really the wrist. So you're doing it up here and then down here um, uh, around the fingers or the toes. Um, and that's just the USGS band. But it makes the ones when they're waiting in the water, it's much easier to read the bands up high. And this bird was just, I found on the internet, um, but it's got the black band. So it was in Florida Bay. And at one point they started doing these extra colors too, but it wasn't, it wasn't deemed necessary. EB was our first banded bird. It was banded at, I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce it, Althea Banks or Althea. That's over in Tampa Bay. Um, so he was banded in 2005 and he came to the alligator farm that same year, drifted on over as a juvenile, hung out for a few years. You could see he was there in the fall, 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 late summer, fall, and wait a second, April. So 2010 is actually the very first year we had Rosie at Spoonbills nesting at the alligator farm. We had four pairs and EB was one of them. EB came back every single year for years. He missed one year, but then he came back the following year and now we haven't seen him for a few years. So I. I presume he passed, which is kind of sad. We're very bonded to him. We could no longer read his band, but we knew him very well. We, and we could see, you know, knowing that it said EB etched in there, we can see that. And you can see, he was always close enough. You could read his USGS band if you needed to. Um, so he was he was our, our first spoonbill and was our favorite, kind of the, our little spoonbill uh, celebrity that we had for years. Um, these bands were from 2015, so we got some really great shots. Uh, I have a NR was seen this morning in the alligator farm. NR has been breeding every year. NP bred last year. I haven't seen NU, but this kind of shows that with other species, wading bird species, birds tend to return to the rookery that they hatched at to produce their own young in the future. And we're definitely seeing that with a lot of our banded spoonbills. There are many we haven't seen, um, but they're not being reported by citizen science um, in, in other locations, but they could be more secretive as well. That's what I'm hoping. So it is a little bit tricky banding the spoonbills. I really don't, I'm climbing up into a palm tree this time, but it's not, it's my least favorite scenario and it's very messy and it's hard to get up to them. And, it doesn't feel the most secure. So I, I don't ban from palm trees very often, but if there's a banded adult, um, Audubon of Florida is really interested in knowing um, just known birds with leg bands and their production of their offspring. So if there's a banded bird that I can get to pretty easily in a shorter palm tree, I'm gonna try to, to get their nests, uh, get the chicks out of their nest. So I banned between two and two and a half weeks of age so they're big enough for the leg bands to not slide down their leg, but they're also not so big that they reach at two and a half weeks, they start getting pretty scrambly. So it's a very tight window of time. And since spoonbills are asynchronous hatchers, one clutch can have chicks within a five to seven day age span. So I, I rarely can do all chicks in the nest. I may be able to band two chicks, maybe three if there's four but usually I can't do all of them because the eggs, edge span is too great. So here's Jim here helping me from his, his buddy. It looks That's probably Bull down there. Came to visit and see what we were doing. <laughs> they like to visit. They're very um, curious, I'll say, and enthusiastic. Um, good old super glue, put the leg bands on. And they're so cute. 
We also pluck feathers from their chest. Let's see if I can see it in here. No. Um, as their feathers are emerging at this side, this one's a really young one. This one's this one's just at two weeks. Um, I like them to be slightly older, but it worked out well. This band didn't slide down the leg. Um, once their feathers emerge, just every day, they emerge a little bit longer and they're just a little less covered in blood feathers. Um, but their chest feathers have really nice blood feathers where I can pluck them and then that DNA allows um, the chicks to be sexed. So then I already have, I already know for Audubon of Florida, hey, here's this chick. We already know it's a male or already, already know it's a female. It's really easy. Here's NR. This is the bird we saw this morning, but this one is when he was just a kid. He's this little washed out pink thing. Um, every year they get pinker and then they get the bold carmine stripes on their wings. They get a little peach on their their head and on their uh, around their preen gland. It's this Georgia peach color. Um, and that's when they're in full breeding season mode. It's beautiful. Oh, look, and these have a little bit of that too. I could actually go on talking about the rookery for hours, but um, I'm sure no one wants that, but I'm happy to ask, answer any more questions. Okay, so let's see. Um, Deborah asks, yeah. so you don't have white ibises breeding? They're very secretive, right? We have small numbers of white ibis. Yeah, I'm. They roost in such giant numbers. I, I almost feel like if they start breeding like consistently, I think we had five nests last year. That was the most we've ever had. Um, I feel like they're gonna take over. <laughs> um, but they they are, it's just very sporadic. And Lois wanna know, are predatory, predatory birds, hawks, owls, eagles, ravens, crows, et cetera, a problem? Um, no, um, I've heard of other rookeries down in South Florida have vulture problems and crow problems. We've historically had a crow issue one time. It's been a very, very long time. And usually we're seeing those things. Um, there was one year where we had, I don't remember what hurricane it was or a tropical storm, but it came in in like late April, peak season. A lot of the chicks were still smaller and so many chicks drowned in the nest. Just the amount of volume and rain that came for like an extended period of time, the chicks were too small and just couldn't handle it. The parents couldn't protect them enough. And so that's when you welcome the cleanup crews actually. Let's see there. Um, Laura wanted to know, is there any possibility of using all that waste for fuel or some type of regeneration options? Well, it's not in one convenient pile typically. <laughs> um, and with HPAI, highly pathogenic avian influenza, still out there rearing its ugly head, it's it's not something you want to be like messing with. That makes sense. Yeah. I mean, there's very few waiting birds that have tested positive in the state. It's primarily been raptors and black vultures, but I didn't do any banding or I didn't do anything with waiting birds last year because it was so unknown. So. Okay. Does anyone have any other questions? I'm seeing lots of comments of love your passion, excellent program, great presentation. Um, if we ever make it that way, I would certainly hope to stop by. Can't yeah, wait. it's just two hours away. I, I go to Universal all the time. You guys come over and come to the recruit. Yeah. Oh, wait, here's when you want to avoid. So spring break is the same throughout Florida, pretty much, but it's the last, it's the end of March. So the couple weeks and the probably the first couple weeks of April is when everyone from up north comes by, comes down. So it's like four to six weeks, basically is spring break. And it's just hard to get around. It's hard to drive around Florida during that time. So just hole up. Um, there's also, we have a big photo festival, photo and, photo and birding festival. It's in April. Um, so for people that are really into nature photography too, you can come and take all sorts of classes and there's a vent at the alligator farm to support all of that. And that's a very popular time for photographers. If you're into educating yourself to learn more and to be around others, if you'd rather take pictures by yourself, then avoid that time too. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. But Lois mentioned she's in British Columbia, so it's a bit. 
<laughs> it's a bit of a hard. Right. You have an excuse. Just come down and visit us. Oh, one thing I didn't mention is um, we just got a we just updated our our rookery cam. It's on explore.org. So it's a live 24-7 camera. It's called, if you go under birds, it's called the Spoonbill and Alligator Camera. It's on explore.org. You could also find it on YouTube, but it just links to explore.org. And um, we have this, they just updated to a, a 4K camera. It's the same one that's in some of the Manatee Springs locations. Um, and so they move it around. Right now, sometimes it's on alligators, but quite often it'll be on the spoonbill nests that are right next to it. So you can just go on the camera when you're in British Columbia and watch all the birds from there. That sounds nice. Explore.org. Explore.org. Yes. All right. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you guys for loving birds. Thank you, Jen. Wait, come up and visit. Okay. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. See you next week. Thanks again. Take care.